Dear Peter, it's really an, an honor to, to receive this uh, diploma and I'm also excited and, and, and happy to be here. Um, every time coming to Prague, I like this very much, uh, both the city, uh, the science, as I have learned from several meetings coming here. And I'm happy to actually um, present this data, this probably also some controversial data to you tonight. Apologies again for being a little bit late. Um, I hope I sk still can make it up to some data that you may not have seen in this perspective or in this view on, on such data from, from other people. Right. This um, slogan from Mark Twain should give you a little bit an introductory sort of tune to the topic. Actually to always for your own work as a clinician, but maybe even so as an active scientist to stay sharp be critical and um, sort of challenge what is given to you as an ultimate truth because for sure it will happen to you as it happened to me while you are working some of your eternal truths may sort of be challenged and maybe over, overturned by new data, by new evidence and actually this is the usual course of, of scientific advance and what I would like to discuss with you is one of those points that is actually, in my view, advancing beyond the stage of what is widely known in public. And maybe after this presentation tonight, and, and from the data that I have um, shown to you, you may also sort of get to challenge uh, the traditional, the classical view on overweight and obesity um, with, uh, together with me. Okay. Obesity and overweight, so excess, excesses body weight, is understood in our society as one of the key features of, cardio, of, of disease risk factors. In fact, probably only two messages have been thoroughly implemented, not only in the medical community, but also in the public. That is the most important two. That is, don't smoke, because smoking is dangerous and don't be overweight, don't have excess body weight, don't be obese. Uh, these two actually, yeah, probably are the most important ones. This is not only in the scientific press, also in the lay press, this is from my country, but I'm sure also in your country, in each journal, you will, in each uh, newspaper, you will find some advice uh, that overweight is something detrimental, something bad for you, and fighting this and avoiding this and getting rid of uh, excessive body weight is actually an most important claim for you to extend your life to be healthy. Well, as I said, health claim number one in the world is losing weight uh, and aim for an ideal body weight. And there's a good cause for that claim, of course. I don't challenge this altogether. The WHO has its homework done. Key facts are just list listed here. There is an rising epidemic uh, about overweight in the society, particularly in our um, industrialized societies, where more than half of the subjects have some sort of excessive body weight, overweight or open obesity. And particularly worse the situation is in the younger generations, where already the excessive body weight uh, starts to, to, to develop in very early um, years and then has an even more detrimental effect in later life. Accordingly, and fully confirmed by multiple data, there is nothing, probably nothing to argue about this in, 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 further, in, in, in much detail. Accordingly, excessive body weight of all of the risks of the burden to, to our, our well-being, to our health, has moved up from the 90s to just the last decade from the 13th position of a ranking list of burdens to our health to the fourth place. So high body mass index is understood as a risk to health on a populational level. This second part of the sentence is very important. The populational level actually is addressed with all those data. And we know of course also from a multitude of clinical trials of basic science uh, research and so on that obesity is not only a risk factor for one disease but it's actually a problem for a whole plethora of diseases, from cardiac diseases, cardiovascular, diabetes, so metabolic, 
um, orthopedic diseases, even tumor and depression, all those are related to some kind, can be related to some kind of excessive body weight. So there is a very clear association of high body weight and impaired health, and this may also uh, refers to impaired survival, i.e. increased mortality. This is the aspect of the primary prevention. But from the gap that you see on the right side of this slide, you may understand that this is maybe not the full picture. And what I would like to discuss with you in this, in, in this lecture is actually the other side, whether there are actually reasons or there are uh, aspects where this negative impact of high body weight on survival may not be applied as thorough as what you usually know. It's important sometimes to take a step back change your perspective on things, you may find hidden treasures, hidden facts that actually may put the whole picture into a different perspective. Here there is another boat on this, on this picture, just not seen from sea level. This is in brief the overview of what I would like to discuss with you. We start from a very simple one, simple aspect discussing the body mass index that I, that I hope you, you all um, know something about. I will Mm, maybe give you some, feed, uh, some, some background information on body mass index that is not so well known so far. Then we uh, look at body mass index uh, obesity in certain subgroups of our population that are particularly important when you uh, work as a doctor. And then we have some further questions that will, be come, that will come up in the discussion. Also, I encourage you to have your question at the end. There's a I hope I can finish a little bit ahead of time and there will be, of course, time for discussions. Those points here are up for you to, to ask or to, to challenge um, what I put to you. Starting with a very simple approach, um, body mass index is one of the most important ways how to assess body composition in today's life. Ever, I assume everybody have, has heard about body mass index so far? Yeah? Okay, thank you. It's of course understood that it's not sufficient to measure your body composition just by your weight because as you see here, an 80 kilogram person may be perfectly well shaped or maybe overweight depending on your height. Uh, distributing 80 kilograms to one meter and 85 looks good uh, and, and maybe a normal proportion of, of tissues it is probably obese or overweight if you are a short person. Therefore, the idea to adjust your total body weight for your body height is actually the underlying principle of body mass index. And when you do that, you see that these two candidates here have one of them has a normal body mass index of 23. I show you the, grade, the grading system for the body mass index in one of the next slides. So this is pretty much uh, in normal proportions, whereas here a body mass index of 31 is already obese, not overweight, but even plainly obese. The background or the history of that body mass index is quite a little bit interesting if you go back to when it has actually been invented or proposed. It's 1830, and in the 1830s, it was the Belgian mathematician, Louis Adolphus, I don't know what the J is for, Louis Adolphus Quetelet. It was also called the Quetelet Index for quite some, some, some decades. He was also an astronomer. Today, we would probably call him an epidemiologist, only that profession didn't exist at that time. And he suggested to adjust height, uh, weight by height to the square. And now to the square would mean a two-dimensional uh, um, um, perspective. And maybe if you have looked at the body mass index in this formula, maybe you have asked yourself, why to the square? Actually, what is, why? We, we are not a two-dimensional figure, we are a three-dimensional figure. If it would be an ideal three-dimensional figure, i.e. a ball, it would have to mean up to, uh, up to the uh, height of three. Obviously, we are not uh, ideal uh, balls, so uh, we, uh, we, uh, ha we are an elliptic uh, three-dimensional figure. So the correct adjustment would probably be more, or has been calculated, uh, would be um, up to 2.4. However, this is so impractical imp uh, and, and, and difficult to understand that actually he proposed to the, uh, to the uh, 
elevated to the 2, and this is, has been st uh, stayed like this ever since. And you see here the uh, subgrouping of body mass index, how this is actually graded in today's system as has been proposed by the World Health Organization. The World he Health Organization has uh, actually put this forward to the public and ha it has gained uh, attention in the public domain only at about the millennium, at about 2000. There was a long discussion before that how actually this should be uh, uh, how, how this grading system should be actually divided. We now, we now uh, call normal weight, sometimes it's also called ideal body weight, and I only warn for, uh, um, can put a warning on saying ideal body weight, but normal body weight uh, has been uh, adjusted, uh, has been termed for a body mass index 18.5 to 25. Then there is a gray zone or an orange zone, let's say, of overweight, which is not obese yet, but overweight, from 25 to 30, and anything above 30 is called obesity with different classes of severity. Underweight is um, for a body mass index below 18.5. Now, where did the WHO get these numbers from? Going back in the search, how this has been developed, actually the source, the original source for this comes from the life insurance databases from some big US American life insurance companies. What they collected, and this is the important point, in the 30s and 40s and a little bit 50s of the 20th century. So very old data in a population that may be a little bit different to the population that we see today. Yeah. And then in the 70s and 80s and 90s, there was a discussion, should we adjust those numbers that are, as you can see here, uh, totally irrespective of gender, of age, of ethnicity, other factors that may have an effect. Should we adjust body mass index according to those factors? And there has been proposals for having a split system for male and female, having a split system for ethnicities and, and also for for age. But at the end, the WHO, the World Health, World Health Organization, decided to get rid of all those extra uh, functions and put forward a very simple but very applicable system that is very easy, that is very robust. It has limitations, no doubt, yeah, but this is uh, um, to be applied in each corner of the world, and there is no, no, there is no calculator needed, there is no, no ruler needed, there is no tables needed. This is what you can do um, very simply and very robust everywhere. But having told you that background, it may also explain to some degree that this system of body mass index assessment may not actually apply to each and everybody in our society. So the question that I would like to discuss with you is, how is the application of those categories, uh, normal body weight, overweight, and obesity, with regard to clinical outcome of those subjects? When we look at certain subgroups in our population, that is old age subjects and patients with a chronic disease. And those are often patients, particularly when you work as a doctor, that come to you, ask for body weight management advice, and then you should sort of not simply look at that, but you should also include uh, some consideration of age and of chronic, of, of, of disease background to make an appropriate and individualized man, uh, weight management advice. From the two points of old age and chronic diseases, let's start with old age. And here comes a clinical um, graph that I would like to, uh, to describe in a little bit detail because those U-shaped curves come up in several slides in the future and I want you to understand what this means. This is actually the U-shape of the mortality risk of patients according to their body mass index. So the X-axis has different subgroups of body mass index, you see from 20 to 45, very obese, and the Y-axis has the relative risk of death Relative risk means there has been one reference group where the risk has been put as one. That is the lowest point of that curve of these women. And this is the lowest point, the nadir of that curve has been just by definition made the risk of the relative risk of one. 
and every other person on that curve has a risk relative to this. So somebody at that line here with a relative risk of two has a twice as high risk to die compared to those. And this is a 50% higher risk to die. You understand? It's understood, okay? Two things come to mind if you look at this with regard to both. Uh, the same applies to women and, and men. Here I put again the uh, categories of the World Health Organization of Body Mass Index, what, we ha what I've shown you before. And you see that the optimum or the normal body weight that is below 25 is not where the lowest mortality is in those patients. It's somehow, uh, well, there's, there's a substantial shift to the right of that U-curve, right? Um, the nadi here is just at the borderline between normal weight and obesity at about 25. In the male population, it's even a little bit towards the overweight uh, subjects. So first of all, those optimum body weights for, the, for this population uh, that is um, like 500 subjects in the US, as you can see here, men and women, and uh, about 60,000 deaths that have been recorded for making this mortality risk curve. Uh, there is a an, an, uh, significant discrepancy between the normal body weight, which should be the body weight that makes you live longest, and where you really live longest, okay? And the second, point that I would like to make on this slide is that the, the curve is actually split according to age subgroups. You see here from 50 to 72 in different groups. And you see on both sides, the women and the men, that particularly in the overweight, in the excessive body weight part, uh, part there, there is an increasing separation of those curves. And it's a flattening of the older ones, as you see here. Those who are older have a lower increase in risk at this, at this overweight part. And if we just, as an example, as a mathematical or as a theoretical example, put one relative risk of 20% increased mortality risk herein. Yeah, so to, we just draw a line at 1.2, that means a 20% increased mortality risk. And we look at where this line is crossing that U-shaped curve, and you look at the very elderly subjects, then you see that those subjects, 66 years, those men, 66 years to 72 years, with a 20% increased risk to die, have either a body mass index of 35 or a body mass index of 22. Now, any healthcare advisor, any nutritionist uh, uh, scientist would recommend to this person you have the best body composition you can think of for your, for your long-term uh, survival, to, to, to decrease your, your, your mortality risk. But in this patient, or in this subject, this is not patient, this is subjects, this is a populational level uh, assessment. In this subject, um, the, everybody would probably recommend that person, you are far too overweight, you should reduce your body weight because that is detrimental to your, to your health, to your survival. You will have an increased mortality risk because of that. The statistics show it's not the case. They have the same mortality risk with 22 as with body mass index 35. A similar assessment has been done by an even bigger population, as you see here. That is 1.7 million, has been some done in the 80s in Norway. And you see here the um, a bigger distribution of age subgroups from the 20s to the almost 90s of, of, of age. And you see here the U-shaped curve of each of these decades. Oh no, it's, it's five-year steps. And you see that the older these patients, uh, the older these people grow, the slower is this U-shape. And at some, at some point, there is no U-shape left any longer. It's more or less a flat line. So that means higher body mass index at that advanced age up here is not really associated with some increased mortality risk any longer. Um, in a higher age, your excess body weight has less impact on your health, even in, the health, even in the average population. Of course, there would be clinicians always like numbers. They like cutoffs when they say up to here it's normal and beyond that point it's pathologic. Where is the limit that, uh, that should be put here with regard to age? 
There has been a proposal for that at the age of 65 years. And this has been, this has come from, an, from a big study from a US American uh, statistician, Catherine Flegel, who had assessed this in an, again, US American um, analysis uh, using data from the National Statistics Institute, where she combined actually almost 3 million people out of 97 clinical, clinical publications where clinical studies have actually been reported. And she has observed that in this population, those subjects with an overweight of um, 25 BMI, 25 to 30, would not have a higher mortality. They would have, in fact, a lower mortality compared to those who have a body mass index of 18.5 to 25. Um, in the uh, obesity grade one, so BMI 30 to 35, there was no higher mortality. You remember the U-shape goes, uh, goes up again, but it's at least not, not significantly higher than the control group of normal body weight. And particularly important at the age above 65 years, none of the overweight or obese patients had an increased, body, uh, increased mortality at all. You may imagine that this statement, hey, at an older age, bigger people have no, have partly a benefit for survival, and they certainly have not a disadvantage for survival. This message is always, and also with this paper from Catherine Flegel, met in the scientific community with great skepticism, even with clear yeah, um, 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 disagreement and, and, and sometimes anger. And it, uh, not only in the uh, scientific community, but also in the public, there is an over exaggeration and a an sort of misinterpretation, sometimes even uh, yeah, desired uh, misinterpretation of those data. As you see here, maybe you, you know this Men's Health uh, uh, Journal, where for lay, purple, lay people it has been suggested, uh, fat guys live longer which is not what she said, which is not what the data says, and no other data doesn't say this either. Uh, but it's a catchy phrase, it's a catchy title, it makes you sell the, the journal, so that's why it has, been, it has been put forward in that provocative terms. But also in the scientific community, those data have been actually um, addressed with some harsh criticism. And here's a comment from an, 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 a professor from Harvard, actually, who concluded that this is... Uh, should be waste should be put to the waste bin it's altogether a pile of rubbish this is i think a very early sign of cancel culture if you ask me this is scientific data that can be uh, sort of criticized on technical grounds but this is an uh, those emotional um, responses are probably not appropriate and if i have sort of confused your mind about the body weight and the uh, implication of obesity of overweight with regard to outcome, with regard to health, then it's not so complicated as you, as it may look after those data. Only what I want to uh, ask you is to have a more differentiated approach to, to this. Not only looking on the left side of that graph, but also looking on the right side. And for, for now, what I have shown to you is that in old age, this truth, high body mass index, is a problem for your survival, may not apply according to the data. Going to the second point, that is how does overweight and obesity relate to outcome, to mortality in patients with chronic disease? This is what we have done a lot uh, over the last like 20 years. Being a cardiologist myself, we started uh, to assess those things in patients with heart failure. There we have the most important data, and there is also what I want to, sh to, to show you the data, to start with the data I, I'm going to show you. This is the mortality data from a clinical trial in patients with heart failure. And you can again see here this U-shape of that curve, yeah, where there is the nadir is about here. You just, if you connect these lines, it's a U-shape, okay? And it's higher at the underweight region. It's going up somewhere in the overweight and obese region. Um, important to understand those graphs is, um, that is all, these dots are always the mean of that subgroup. 
And these lines here is the distribution within that subgroup because they don't have, this is just a mean value and this is the distribution uh, to that mean. And as long as this distribution line is not crossing that line that I draw, draw, have drawn at the one point, at the risk of one, as long as this uh, separation is, uh, as long as this distribution line is separate from that red line, that means that there is a significant, a statistically significant increased risk. Okay, so those patients have a significantly increased risk of twice as high as this reference group to die. These still have an increased risk, which is statistically significant. And those patients here seem to have an increased risk. However, this uh, distribution line is, is, is crossing the line of equality. Therefore, the statistically significance is not met at that point. It's very intuitive that they, they have an increased risk, but statistically you would not, allow, not be allowed to say there's an increased risk. Okay? But here, for those patients, you can definitely say there's a statistically uh, significant decreased risk of dying. And you see here, this is the BMI subgroup of 27 to 30. So they have a lower mortality compared to what has been used here as a reference group of 25 to 75. 25 to 25 to 27.5 okay so again the u shape of that curve is shifted to the right and those with increased body weight overweight and obesity they do not have an increased mortality this is so overweight in those heart failure patients is not a problem for those patients for them to die that was chronic heart failure here is data from a huge database uh, from the US of patients that have been admitted to emergency department with acute heart failure. So acute um, breathlessness, dyspnea, swollen uh, legs, water in their lungs, acute heart failure. And a very severe um, emergency situation, many of those, people, of those patients actually may die. And what you see of this cohort of 100,000 patients with acute heart failure, this is the distribution of the body mass index up to the gigantic numbers of above 60. This is US American population, um, by the way. And you see here, uh, this overall cohort has been split into quartiles. And you see here the, the four, the highest quartile. So a quarter of the overall number of patients with the highest BMI uh, range from 33 to, uh, to 60. So clearly heavily obese patients. And if we look now at the mortality of those patients, how they survived that acute event in the emergency department, you see there's not even a U-shape of that curve left. It's only going down and the lowest point is, the lowest point that we see is here, but if you would assume there is a curve that would go up at that point, at that side here, it has only not been investigated, um, then the nadir is somewhere here. So obese people with acute heart failure have a better outcome than those patients with uh, low, and, uh, low body mass index and certainly those patients with underweight. Another population uh, where overweight and body mass index is usually concerned as a problem is patients with diabetes. Diabetes is very tightly relinked to cardiovascular diseases, arteriosclerosis. From arteriosclerosis you get myocardial infarction, coronary artery disease, heart failure. So diabetes and cardiac problems go hand in hand and are both a very detrimental combination. We looked at a database of a clinical trial where patients with diabetes and cardiovascular comorbidity or cardiovascular risk factors have been, have been in investigated. 12,000 patients with this comorbidity, diabetes or prediabetes and cardiovascular problems. Again, you see here the, um, the distribution of the BMI um, across the spectrum of BMI. The, the colored area here is what has been uh, considered as the normal range. We did not go down to uh, 18.5 here. We did only consider the normal range 22 to 25. Okay, so again, many of these patients are overweight and obese, which is the classical um, finding in diabetic patients. They are usually di type, type two diabetes, they are usually overweight and obese. And what we looked at the, uh, when we looked at the mortality of those patients, then you see here, 
the all-cause mortality as much as the cardiovascular mortality. So those patients only dying from any kind of heart-related problems. Okay, whereas here you have also other mortality, including casualty, trauma, cancer, other things, uh, just not cardiac related. And in both of those mortality uh, um, um, considerations, the U-shape again can be seen, but it's heavily shifted towards the right. Uh, so again, overweight and obese patients are not, have not the problem of an increased mortality. They have actually an advantage of their uh, mortality, uh, which is related to that excessive body weight. When we presented those data for the first time in the German Cardiac National Conference in, in Mannheim, like 2004 or 5 or something, it was of course met with strong criticism. There was, it was a very loud audience at that, uh, at that meeting uh, when it was first presented, not by me, but my, by my mentor. And I remember that we had uh, one of the famous surgeons in the room, famous uh, German surgeon, um, Roland Hetzer, who was at that time the chair, chair of the German Heart Surgery Center in Berlin, which was one of the reference uh, addresses for, for uh, cardiac surgery, bypass surgery at that time. Nowadays, bypass surgery is going down because more and more of those patients can be treated with um, intervention by a cardiologist with a catheter. Uh, and the stenting, but at that time, bypass was the best possibility to, to treat coronary artery disease. And he said, that is rubbish, that can't be. Your observation of overweight and obesity being a better, uh, having a better outcome cannot apply to my surgery patients, because what we always tell obese patients, you are too big. Come back when you have, five, when you have lost at least five kilograms, then you will survive that surgery easier. You have less problems and so on. So he was really kind of outraged about um, what has been proposed by our data. But what he did was, as a scientific approach, he put one of his, uh, one of his uh, senior doctors to that task and said, look at all our surgery, bypass surgery patients for the period back to 1990. And you see, he, they col collected like 22,000 patients over this 11 year period. And of course, weighing your patient is one of the key and, and initial assessments. So that has been done in all of these patients. And then he put the mortality of those patients to uh, the body mass index. And what you see here, and this is what you see here again. And he came then to, to, to us and say, look what I found. You had it right. And I, was, I had a completely wrong impression of, of the association of body weight and, and outcome. This is what we see in our bypass surgery patients. The patients with the lowest mortality was again used as the reference uh, cohort for comparing all other subgroups to this one. The lowest one, so the nadir of that U-shape, if you want to call it that way, is that one with a body mass index of 33. And all other subgroups had a more or less higher, body, uh, had a higher risk of mortality. You see, this is, yeah, you, can, you can imagine some kind of U-shape here going up on this side, certainly going up on this side. And the significance of that increased mortality starts at the body mass index below 21. So again, those with an underweight have a problem with regard to mortality of their survival, okay? Those with an overweight, which is a body mass index from 26 to 30, 25 to 30, this is overweight and above 30, this is obese they do not have an increased risk of mortality, bypass surgery patients. Recently, we kind of repeated this analysis looking for all patients who were admitted to emergency, to, to emergency departments in the metropolitan area of Berlin. You see, again, over 15 years uh, collecting almost 30,000 patients, and it's the same finding. It's like a kind of U-shape but the lowest point is somewhere in the overweight and mildly obese region. What you can at least say, they do not have an increased risk. Yeah? Even if it's not significant uh, that, the, that the risk is decreased in those, but they definitely have not an increased risk. Again, myocardial infarction in patients uh, putting, uh, being, being put to hospital and to, to catheter uh, intervention. 
All I have shown you so far were cardiovascular patients, and there is a, most of the data is available for cardiovascular patients, but this is not the only one, and uh, the only disease. And I would like to show you here one, and only this one, graph where it has been done, where the analysis has been done in non-cardiac patients. This is patients with uh, permanent um, hemodialysis, so uh, terminal kidney failure. They have to be, to be put on a machine like two, three times per week. It's a very severe but life-threatening uh, treatment, hemodialysis. And you see here a comparison of those patients with hemodialysis, that's the red line, and uh, the normal population in that area. That was from San Diego, actually. And actually, there's no, there's no U-shape left any longer for the hemodialysis patients. The bigger they are, the lower is their, is their mortality. Whereas in the normal population, you see exactly what you expect, a U-shape where there is the normal, uh, the, the optimum survival somewhere in this normal body mass index between 22 and, 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 and 25. So it's not only the cardiovascular patients, it's broader than that. And there has been other uh, diseases where it has been tested. I could continue with putting those data to you for probably another hour or two. Um, I stop here, but I just want to summarize. In any of those clinical conditions where the association of body weight and mortality has been looked at in detail, in the detail that I have shown you, they usually find the same association. If you have such a chronic disease or an, 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 an illness, then mild obesity is usually not associated with an increased risk, but in many of those cases, it's even associated with a reduced risk. And this is basically what has been at the very initial um, publications, at the very initial publications has been termed obesity paradox because a paradox is a catchy title and it, it makes people to stop when they scan a journal, they fall into that, uh, that, that paper and they read it. So it's an eye-catching phrase. However, it's had a, it has a disadvantage, which I will tell you in a second. So this is actually what they uh, called, what they, what they uh, proposed as a paradox. And to summarize this obesity paradox from a clinical perspective is that it's in contrast, it's uh, paradicting to your normal exp expectation. It's in contrast to the primary prevention, i.e. to the healthy population. There is where our wisdom comes from. And what we usually do is uh, extending our knowledge from the healthy population to those patients. Because if it's true here, it's for sure also true over there. Only that's not the case. Yeah. So if you have a patient with, a, with, a, with an established chronic disease, then overweight is usually associated with a better survival, overweight being BMI 25 to 30. Uh, low body mass index is in most of the cases associated with a worse survival. And here's a third point that I didn't address so far and probably we uh, will not have the time to go into this in detail. But if we observe a weight loss in a chronic disease patient, that is a detrimental sign because there's a catabolic activity ongoing and that leads to weight loss and that is an associated with a higher mortality. So these three points actually are combined in the catchy phrase paradox, uh, obesity paradox. However, after all those data for like 20 years, at that point it was only 15 years, with uh, tested in different populations, in different diseases, with different methods and different analytical approaches, always coming down to the same finding, overweight has a protection, has a protective effect in, in, uh, dis in patients, in diseased patients. Uh, it was actually proposed by us that it should not be called a paradox, it should be called a paradigm not an unexpected, unexplained finding, but sort of a principle finding that we should rely on because it has been proven to be robust. The problem with the paradox term is it's unclear. And while it's nice to discuss, nobody from a clinical, from a clinical perspective would base a treatment decision on a paradox. Yeah, because it's unexplained, I don't know what it means, so I would not make a decision for a treatment based on a paradox. In turn, a paradigm could help you to make a more considerable, considerate 
um, weight management recommendation. Therefore, paradigm should be the better term in this context. However, I'm afraid paradox is just too uh, well perceived, too eye catching, that it will be very hard to change from the paradox to the paradigm. And again, I want, don't want to set upside down your, your perspective on body weight. All I want to do is to give you a second perspective on some subgroups in our population, in our, in our um, yeah, populations, where the primary prevention wisdom may not apply, where high body weight is not a risk factor. This is subjects with old age, and this is patients with chronic disease. This is altogether the uh, story of the uh, obesity paradox, and I could stop here. I don't know where we are with time, but if you are interested, we can either refer to them some of those questions, or of course, I'm happy to answer your questions if there are others than those.